and we're live hi everybody who's zero but hi and welcome to the eighth grade forensics showcase um we are very excited to show you our work um now the eighth graders who are all sitting behind me here may be very nervous they perform all the time but it's a whole lot scarier knowing your loved ones are watching you so when you do see them at home, um, please congratulate them, be welcoming. We do have a little chat that you should be able to type into the chat so you can cheer them on. Um, and our first performer is already waiting, ready to perform for you guys. So Talia is going to be performing and she has a poetry piece. Um, for those unfamiliar with poetry, this is a piece that she's not allowed to move. She's not allowed to take any steps and she's required to actually refer to her piece. So you'll see a binder in her hand. Is it, it isn't because she forgot her piece. It's because she is required to hold that binder in her hand. Um, so Talia, I'm going to make you go live. You are good to go. Talia. Oh, right. Hold on. Hold on, Talia. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He, sorry, I interrupted you. Our volume was all funky. I don't think anyone could hear you. You're good. Go ahead and try again. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, you're perfect. Go ahead. life of a child, our world is shaken. And shake with the kids. The crickets have arthritis. The speaker struggles to see goodness or believe in a higher power as he watches a child face his last days. It doesn't matter why I was there, where the air is sterile and the heat sting. It doesn't matter that I was hooked up to this thing that buzzed and beat every time my heart leaps. It doesn't matter. Because my hospital roommate wears Star Wars pajamas. And he's nine years old. His name is Lewis. And I don't have to ask what he's got. The bald head in the body frame speaks volumes. The toy and feather pillow boom. Hey, they're trying to make him feel at home because he's going to be there a while. I managed to smile the first time I see him. And it feels like the biggest lie I've ever had. So I hold my breath because I'm thinking any minute now he's going to call me on it. I hold my breath because I'm scared of a 57 pound boy hooked up to a machine. Because he's been watching me. So I look away. But my fear subsides in the moment that I realize that Lewis is all about show and tell. He's got everything from a shotgun shell to a crow's foot. And he can put them all in context like, see, this is from a shooting range. See, this is from a weird girl. I watch his hands curl around a cufflink and tie tag and realize that Every knickknack is a treasure. And every treasure's got a story. And every time I think that I can't handle more, he hits me with another story and says, see, this is from my father. See, this is from my brother. See, this is from that weird girl. See, this is from my mother. It took me two days to figure out that that weird girl was his sister. It took him about two hours today after she left to figure out that he missed her. They visit every day and stay well past visiting hours because to them that term doesn't apply. And there's no easy way of asking it. I already know what he's gonna say. 
And maybe he just needs to say it. So I ask him anyway. Are you scared? Who is, does even lower his voice when he says, yeah, I listen to a nine-year-old boy say that like he's a 30-year-old man. But before I can forget that Lewis is only nine years old, he says, please don't tell my dad. He asks me if I believe in angels. And before I realize I don't have the heart to tell him, I tell him, not lately. And I just lay there waiting for him to hate me. But he doesn't know how to, so he never does. Who is never greets me in silence? He only smiles. And with the patience I've never seen in someone who knows they're dying. I've been with them for five days. And all I really know is that Lewis loves to pull feathers out of his pillow and watch them float to the ground. Almost as if he's the philosopher inside of the scientist, waiting to say that it's gravity's been getting us down. But the truth is, there's not enough miracles to go around here. And there's too many people petitioning God for the winning lotto ticket. And for every answer prayer, there's a cricket with arthritis. And the only reason we can't find the answers is because the search party didn't invite us. And right now, the crickets have arthritis. So there is no music, no symphony of nature swelling to crescendos. So we must meet the silence with the same level of noise that the parents of tiny nine-year-old boys make when they take liberties in talking with heaven. And I swear to whatever God I can find in the time that I have left, I'm going to remember you, kid. Can I tell your story as often as every story you told me? And every time I tell it, I'll say, see, there's bravery in this world. A nine-year-old boy taught me that. Lewis and I cracked this world wide open and found the prize inside. We sing in our own vibrations and dare angels to each out to stop mid-flights pluck feathers from their wings and write demands on God's hands. I don't often believe in angels. But on the day that I left, Lewis pulled a feather from his pillow and said, this is for you. I half expected him to say, see, this is the first one I grew. Thank you. Good job, Talia. You can come back, Talia. Okay. All righty. So up next is Alex Maley. Um, and thank you, Talia, for dealing with our original tech glitches and we're as we figured this out, and our audience members for being patient with us. But Alex Maley is um, doing a piece for storytelling. Um, they can't see you. He's waving at the camera right now. Here, I'll show you him. There he goes. All right, they can see you now. Um, so Alex here will be doing a storytelling piece. And so this is a children's story that was written by another author. However, um, Alex went ahead and put it in his own words. And so he will per be performing this fun children's story for us all. Alex, why don't you take it away? All right. Dealing with children can be difficult. It's Especially at bedtime. Some parents try to coax their little one into bed with a bedtime story. For Papa Chicken and Little Red Chicken, this strategy does not work. Little Red Chicken simply gets too excited and constantly interrupts the story in David Ezra Stein's book, Interrupting Chicken. It was bedtime for Little Red Chicken. All right, my little feather ball, it's time to get some shy and go to sleep, said Papa Chicken. Little Red Chicken jumped into bed. Bedtime stall be bedtime stall be, cried Little Red Chicken. All right, all right, settle down, said Papa. Papa walked over to the bookshelf and picked up a book. Look here, little chick, it's one of your favorites, Hansel and Gretel. But you're not going to keep interrupting the story tonight, right? Said Papa Chicken. 
I'll be good, Papa. I promise, said the little red chicken. Papa began to read. In the story, Hansel and Gerda were very, very, very hungry. So they went deep into the woods and found a house made of candy. They ate and ate and ate and ate and ate all the candy until a little old woman came out and said, What pretty little children? Why don't you come inside and eat some more candy? Papa Chicken then read, the children were about to go up the old lady when hey, the woods jumped a little red chicken. And he said, don't go with the old lady. She's really, 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 really bad. So the children ran back home and it happily ever after. The end, exclaimed the little red chicken. Papa Chicken sighed. You interrupted my story again. Please try to quietly listen. But, but Papa, she was a really, really, really bad witch. I couldn't let the children go with her, explained the little red chicken. Please, 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 please bring me one more bedtime story, and I promise I'll fall asleep. Papa Chicken walked back over to the bookshelf and picked up another book, hoping that this time around, little red chicken would listen. The next story was Little Red Riding Hood. Papa began to read. Little Red Riding Hood was taking a basket of bread and wine to her grandmother. Like in church? Interrupted Little Red Chicken. Not now, Little Chick. Sit back and listen, said Papa. Papa explained how Little Red's mother had warned her to not stray from the path because the woods were full of dangers like wolves. Little Red Riding Hood left, and as she was skipping along the path, a wolf stepped out of the woods and greeted her. Then Papa Chicken read. The wolf was about to compliment the little girl on her dress when Hallowitz jumped a little red chicken and he said, run away, run away. The wolf is really, really, really bad. So little red riding hood ran past the wolf and into her grandma's house and lived happily ever after. The end, exclaimed the little red chicken. Papa Chicken sighed again. You interrupted my story again. That's two stories now and you're not even sleeping. If you interrupt my story one more time, I'm not going to read you another one said, or rather threatened, Papa Chicken. But, 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 Papa, it was a really bad wolf, explained the Little Red Chicken. Please, 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 please bring me one more bedtime story, and I promise I'll fall asleep. Papa Chicken walked back over to the bookshelf and picked up one last book. This time, he told the tale of Chicken Little. In the story, an acorn hit Chicken Little on the head, and he thought the sky was falling down. Then Papa Chicken read. He was about to run off and warned Goosey Lucy, Ducky Lucky, Henny Penny, and everyone else in town that the sky was falling down when Hound jumped a little red chicken and he said, Don't panic, don't panic. It was just an acorn. Everything is fine. So Chicken Little didn't panic. The end, exclaimed the little red chicken. Papa Chicken sighed again. You interrupt my story yet again. But, 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 but Papa. I couldn't let him get all upset over an acorn. Please, 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 me one more bedtime story. And I promise, I promise I'll be really, really, really good. But Pop Chicken and no more stories. They've gone through them all. Hmm. How about you tell me a story? Suggested Pop Chicken. Me? Telling a story? Um, okay. Um, um, oh, Bedtime for Papa by Widow Red Chicken. Widow Red Chicken had to put his papa to bed. He wore them 152 stories and even gave him some warm milk and delicious sugar free cookies. But nothing worked. Papa stayed awake. Oh, snored Papa Chicken. Papa? Are you awake? <laughs> Snorted Papa Chicken. Little Red Chicken sighed and then crawled into bed next to his father. Good night, Papa. Thank you.
my, sorry, I was talking to you on mute. Thank you, Harry, for the tip. Woo, and things are falling in here. Okay, next up is going to be uh, Catherine Purvis. And Catherine is performing a Farrago piece. Uh, Farrago is a mixture of prose and poetry that come together thematically in some way. Hers is a collection of pieces about uh, the Holocaust. So, Catherine, give me one second and I'll get you on deck here. All right, Catherine, it's all you. During World War II, under the Nazi regime, a long history of anti-Semitism and a search for power resulted in one of the most tragic genocides in human history. During the Holocaust, over six million Jews died, and many Jewish children struggled to understand their new roles in society. The protagonist of Milkweed by Jerry Spinelli searches to identify himself while living in a ghetto in Warsaw. He's a boy called Jew, gypsy, stop thief, runt, happy, fast, filthy son of Abraham. Number 25141. Dead. He's a boy who lives in the streets of Warsaw. He's a boy who steals food for the orphans. He's a boy who believes in bread and mothers and angels. He's a boy who wants to be a Nazi someday with tall, shiny jackboots and a gleaming eagle hat of his own. Until that day that suddenly made him change his mind. And when the train come to empty the Jews from the ghetto of the damned, he's a boy who realizes it's safest of all to be nobody. The protagonist of Milkweed is confused by a strong desire to become a powerful Nazi until this is contradicted by the realization that the Nazis were the reason that his life was so difficult. All children who lived through this horrific event were trapped in a world of confusion. In the book, Yellow Star, Jennifer Roy penned her Aunt Sylvia's confusion amid these same events. The effects of the war came knocking on Sylvia's door when she was only five years old. I am hiding in my special place behind the armchair in the parlor brushing my doll's hair, listening. The worry of the grown-ups fills the air. We must leave Waltz right away. This city is unsafe for Jews. My papa says, my mind freezes on one word, Jews, Jews. We are Jews. I am Jewish. What does it matter that we are Jews? I whisper my question into my doll's ear. She just stares back at me. Yellow is the color of the six-pointed star that is sewn into my coat. The star of David. I wish I could rip the star right off because Yellow is meant to be a happy color, not the color of hate. While some children of the Holocaust, like Sevilla, survived this horrific event, they were still left with the painful memories burned deep inside their minds. Alexander Kimmel, another Holocaust survivor, agonizes on the importance of these memories in his poem, The Action in the Ghetto of Rohan. Do I want to remember the ghetto before the raid? Children shaking like leaves in the wind, shadows on swollen legs moving with fear. No, I don't want to remember. But how could I forget? Do I want to remember the creation of hell? The shouts of the raiders enjoying the hunt rise of the wounded, begging for life, hiding children, dripping with fear. 
No, I don't want to remember. But how could I forget? Do I want to remember the wailing of the night, the doors kicked ajar, ripped feathers floating in the air, the night scented with snow melting blood? No, I don't want to remember. But I cannot forget. Do I want to remember this world upside down where the departed are blessed with an instant death while the living condemned to a short, wretched life and a long, torturous journey into unnamed place, converting living souls into ashes and gas? No, I have to remember and never let you forget. Forgetting the pain caused here should never be an option. We must learn from this tragedy that humanity created. We must remember that we have the power to identify ourselves, to speak up, to adopt the identity that brings us most joy. In the book, Milkweed by Jerry Spinelli, the boy who began by searching for who he was, finds peace with who he has become far after the close of World War II. Now, my granddaughter tires of the swing and plops down in my lap. Rock, Poppy Noodle. I rock. I smile. I close my eyes. I think of all the voices that have told me who I've been, the names I've had. Call me thief. Call me stupid. Call me gypsy. Call me Jew. I don't care. Empty-handed victims once told me who I was, then an armband, then a number, then an immigration officer. And now this little girl in my lap, this little girl whose call silences the tramping jackboots. Her voice will be the last. I was, no I am. I am Poppy Noodle, thank you. All righty, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, for Lily, I'm gonna give everyone a like two minute intermission here so that these guys behind me can grab some dessert. Lily, don't worry, we'll save some for you. Someone save some for Lily, but you guys can go back there and grab some dessert. As they're doing that, I'll take a second to say thank you. Um, this program is absolutely not, not possible at all without the help of our many, many, many volunteer judges. Um, so many of these kids' parents, whether they're from sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, have had parents who've stepped up to be our judges. And they give up their time, um, their Saturdays, their Fridays, their Sundays, to sit in front of a computer and judge all of these speakers. Without them, we would not be able to have this program. In addition to that, I benefited from the help of people like Miss Matthews, wherever she is, she's helping me tonight. She helps me a lot in organizing a lot of these things and volunteering. Other teachers have volunteered to supervise so that these kids could come to school and compete and not be competing from their homes. And Mrs. Hess has been helping coach this year. Um, she sees a couple kids a week, which is a huge, tremendous help. So again, it takes a lot of hands to make this program happen. And I'm so very, very grateful for all of the people that have helped me, um, not just create the program, but sustain the program. So as these people come back to their seats, we'll get started. For, for now, I'm gonna mute myself and give them a second to find their seats again.
We're almost ready. One more person really had to run to the bathroom. Almost. Alrighty, we are back with you. Um, so up next is Lily. And Lily is in non-original oratory, which means she's going to be giving a speech that she didn't write. Someone else gave this speech at some point, but she's performing it and making it her own. Um, so Lily, they can see you now. And I'm about to mute myself so you can take it away. Nine months, almost a year. That's how long Elizabeth Smart went missing. When at the age of 14, she was abducted from her home in Salt Lake City, Utah on June 5th, 2002. Later in 2014, she gave a TED talk at the University of Nevada telling her story of how even in the deepest, darkest times, we can always find a way to move forward. I, I don't know anyone who has a perfect life. Nobody. And I know that every single one of us has our own personal challenges and trials. And there are days when we wish we didn't have to get out of bed but we all have a choice to make. We have the choice to stay in bed and pull the cover for us. Or we have a choice to move forward. When I was 14, nothing special stood out about me. I was just an average girl getting ready to graduate junior high. Very excited. I remember one night, I went to bed in a room that I shared with my sister. I remember waking up to a voice, a strange voice saying, I have a knife at your neck. Don't make a sound. Get up and come with me. That started a nine month long nightmare. I remember this strange man taking me up into the mountains, all at knife point. We came to a grove of trees. There was a tent set up, and there were tarps laying on the ground and hanging from trees. But the most scary part of this whole scene was the woman that emerged from the tent. She brought me in and sat me down on a bucket where bunch bathed me. I was very, very shy and very, very self-conscious. And that was about the most traumatic thing that happened to me. I remember pleading with her to let me do it myself. That I wasn't dirty and I changed myself. I didn't need her help. Finally, after 15 minutes of of begging and crying me there. I remember crying and crying, thinking of what had happened to me. How just yesterday, I had been at school with my friends. How just yesterday, I had been at home to graduating. How had this happened to me? How had my world turned from day to night. What was going on to me? Is he going to kill me? 
real lives being kidnapped. Nobody ever comes home. Every story the news reports, it's always the same. Maybe it's days later, weeks later, years later. A body is found. But that's just what happens. As I sat there crying, being so scared, I remember the tent door zipping. And in walked this man. He knelt down next to me, where he began to speak. First, I was so caught in my own worries and fears, I couldn't even begin to think, to listen to what this man was saying. Finally, some part of me pulled myself together long enough to hear the words that I was no. I remember begging and pleading and crying and coming up with every reason I possibly could to try to convince man to let me go. To not hurt me and to release me back to my family. But nothing I said or did made a difference. I'll never forget how I felt. How broken I felt. How I was beyond all help and all hope that even if someone did find me, what was the point? I was useless. I wasn't worth saving. I fell asleep thinking those thoughts. And when I woke, the man had taken a thick metal cable and had wrapped it around my ankle and bolted it so it didn't run away. In that moment, I began thinking of all the children I had seen on the news, whose stories had ended so tragically, and I couldn't help but think that they are the lucky ones. I, I wished I could be one of those children, because no, no one would ever hurt them again. Very early on, I made a decision that I wasn't going to let these captors win. I wasn't going to let them take my, my life away. Even if that meant outliving them, abused by them every single day. Nine months later, I will never forget the first time I saw my dad had picked me up. No matter what lay in front of me, it was going to be okay. And no one would ever be able to make me hurt the way these two people made me hurt the last nine months. It's the best feeling in the world knowing that someone loves you. The following day, my mother gave me a piece of advice that I'd like to share with you. Because, like I said, we all have those trials in life all have those moments where we don't want to get out of bed. My mother said to me, Elizabeth, what this man has done to you is terrible. He has taken nine months of your life that you won't get back. The best punishment you could possibly give him is to be happy. Move forward with your life. Don't you dare give them another second of your life. I have tried to follow that advice every day since then. I am a long from following it perfectly, but then again, what daughter is good at following her mother's advice? But I know that we all have a choice. I know that when we are faced with trials, we have a choice. We can give in surrender, We can find a way to move. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, Lily. So there was definitely a big lag there in our sound. Um, so luckily, Lily's very expressive, and we were able to hear the emotion in her voice. Um, we are going to go ahead and start our next. 
speaker and then maybe try to move that camera to one a room with better Wi-Fi. Um, so next up is Helen. Helen is in serious solo acting um, and she is performing a piece called The Bald and the Beautiful. And Helen, they can see you now. So go ahead and take it away. Most teens find themselves agonizing over the reflection in the mirror. It's hard to accept that image, to be proud of the face looking back. In The Bald and the Beautiful by J.J. Jones, Mariana fights to accept her new looks. However, unlike most teens, in accepting the reflection in the mirror, she must also come to terms with her cancer. When I was first diagnosed with leukemia, I thought it was the end of the world. Well now, that's not quite true. At first, I just didn't believe it. Denial, my doctors called it. Then I went through the tragic heroin phase, romanticized it. But it is rather difficult to feel romantic and beautiful when vomit is dripping from your lip. I'm sorry, it's just true. There's just not much romantic about chemotherapy treatments, hassle visits, needles, and a churning stomach. The truth is you're wrenching your guts out, your insides are on fire, and you've never felt closer to hell. Maybe I'm being a bit harsh. They want to keep your mind in a positive state. Keep all the feel-good endorphins flowing as long as possible. Because when the cold reality sets in, and you're throwing up, and your hair is falling out on the floor in clumps, as you're hugging a toilet or drooling over some steel bedpan, there's a very little chance of producing anything that makes you feel good. You start to hate their cheery dispositions, promoting positive attitudes, and you start to snarl a bit, baring your teeth at them. Sorry, maybe it really wasn't that bad. Really, the people here care. It's just that you feel so so helpless. The illness steals so much from you. Not just the way you look, but your confidence and the ability to bounce back automatically. It steals your faith. It steals you. My true friends, they understood, but I couldn't bear to go back to school. It's not that anyone was cruel to me. They felt sorry for me. I couldn't stand the looks of pity and being treated like every day was my last. I wanted to scream. Even the teachers treated me like I was about to break. They gave me more time for assignments, even when I didn't need it. Well, all but one. Miss Jensen. She gave me more work. Now, Mariana, if you're sitting around in waiting rooms all day, you might as well be listening to books on tape. Here, here are six. With all the time you have, you can list them all in one week. Her expectations were pretty high. Then, one day, after a particularly tough chemo session, I couldn't take it anymore. Miss Jensen showed up at my house. I was sitting in the living room watching something on TV. 
Now, Mariana, if you're well enough to be watching this, you are well enough to be listening to books on tape. But you will not be sitting here not learning. I simply forbid that. You what? Do you forbid it? What is your problem? You are not the one with leukemia. You are not the one puking through chemo treatments and having your hair fall out. You come talk to me when you understand how I really feel. Get over yourself and back off, lady. I wanted to slap my hand over my face and stop the words from coming out. It was too late. I didn't sleep very well that night. I felt bad for what I had said to Miss Jensen. She had always been the one teacher who believed in me, who always pushed me to be my best. Three days passed. Suddenly, everyone stopped calling. I'd figure they'd all forgotten about me and moved on with their lives. Then, the doorbell rang. In my front yard were dozens of my classmates standing there. On my front porch were my two best friends and Miss Jensen. They were wearing scarves. Slowly, they removed them. Under the scarves were freshly shaved scalps. They were completely bald. Miss Jensen stepped forward and took my hand. You were right, Mariana. We want you to come back to school because we miss you. We can't feel what you are feeling right now, but no, you are not alone. I started to cry. There they were, bald as eagles, on my front porch, so I wouldn't feel alone. I've always known that inner beauty is more important. But even when you know that you are truly beautiful and more than brave, it means the most to know that you are loved and that makes you feel the most beautiful of all. Thank you. All righty, that was Helen for you. And up next in a room change here, hopefully this will work out better for us, will be Jonah. Jonah is in the category of persuasive speaking. So he has um, written his own speech um, and I'll let him reveal what that topic is. So Jonah, you are on now. Take it away. Well, actually, hold on a second. It's pixelating on you. Whoa, it's really pixelating on you. Don't start speaking, Jonah. Your camera's doing all sorts of fun things. So this is cool. Um, I'm gonna do this and we're gonna chat. Wait, oh, is it fixed? Oh, look at that. All right, Jonah, take it away. All right, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay. At any age, people experience manipulation. People who you may think are your friends may actually turn out to be your enemies. People who are only around you for their own personal gain and can cause permanent. Let me say that, that again. Permanent mental and emotional damage that can affect multiple parts of your life. That is exactly 
exactly why. You need to put a stop to manipulate. Because simply, people who manipulate just, just rip apart healthy relationships. Manipulation is used to control and trick people into doing something they may not, not have originally wanted to do. It allows one person to have power over the other. According to Psychology Today, manipulative have mastered the art of deception. They may appear respectable and sincere, but often this is just a front. It's a way to draw you in and trap you in a relationship before they show you their true colors. People who manipulate may do so in two different ways. And they may play the victim, making you seem to be the one who cause a problem which they begin but won't take responsibility for. Or they will act extremely aggressive and vicious, resorting to personal claims and criticism. They, they are relentless in the pursuit of what they, they want and have little group to assert along the way. While it is clear that manipulate is also important that we learn to stay away from these people and stay end up to them because there are many very many negative effects of becoming the tar target of a master manipulator. Peaks Recovery Center, a health treatment center, notes that mental manipulation could cause problems with trust, respect, and security. Beyond that, people who are manipulated may wonder exactly why their loved ones are suddenly like a complete stranger. Finally, the victim can, in the end, develop depressive disorders feel shame and guilt as they blame themselves for setting off the master manipulator. Peaks Recovery Center adds that this person may begin to avoid eye contact, walk on it, or even isolate. Worst of all, victims of manipulation can develop depressive disorders. Since becoming manipulated by someone else can lead to such terrible consequences, we all need to learn to stand up for ourselves and take in our own lives. The website, a very well minded, it says that we must start by accepting that acts are a big deal, not at all to be combined. Start by trying to tell the person how you feel, be specific acts of manipulation. Time magazine adds emotional boundaries can help stop manipulation as it distance the manipulative victim. Refuse to make large purchases or commitments with this person as well. Finally, try to not allow the behavior to affect you personally. Observe their actions, their words, but choose not to observe them. You can't control how other people feel, but in the end, you can control how you do respond. Because people in your life, people who may claim to be your close friends, they may try to control you. That is, you need to learn to recognize when manipulation is happening, shut it down. You should try to get the manipulator out of your life and do what's best for yourself. It is not your fault if you are being manipulated, but you do have to take control when it's happening. Do yourself a favor and stand up for yourself. Speak out and take control. Uh, thank you. All righty, so we still had a big lag there. I, we are aware of that. Thinking now it's the computer and not the room we're in, so we're going to switch computers on that one. Um, but in the meantime, oh, Waverly, you're up next, and she's sitting right here, so she needs to go to her room. <laughs> so we're going to have a, a little brief intermission here anyways as we uh, wait for Waverly. And I'm gonna send something to the next computer that we're going to try to be using instead of what we just were using. You guys, they can hear you. <laughs> we're definitely on. Uh, Waverly setting herself up right now. I see that. Now I will talk about Waverly as she's setting her camera up. 
Um, Waverly is in serious solo acting, um, and she's performing a piece called Forget Me Not. She's just making sure her camera's good to go, so once she gives me the thumbs up, I'll go ahead and put her on the screen. All right, I got a thumbs up from Waverly. All right, there is Waverly, go for it. Fitting in for anyone is difficult to do. However, being able to make friends is even more difficult for those that are born different than the rest of us. Calliope is a young girl with Tourette's, a disorder that makes it hard to control her movements and sometimes even her words. Her story is told in Ellie Cherry's book, Forget Me Not. We're moving. Every time mom breaks up with one of her silly boyfriends, it's grab the keys, pack the car, hit the road, don't look back. I sneak into the bathroom, close the door so she can't see me pulling out my hair. I wish I didn't wind strands that are on my finger, twirl them once, twirl them twice, Yank them out? Ouch! I flush the hair down the toilet. Can't let mom see. Mom said the next time she sees, she's going to cut it. By the time I was four, mom could tell I had a lot of quirks. I'd chew my nails to bloody stumps, eat my food in a certain order, and worry, worry about everything. Sometime during second grade, I started having tics, twitching my nose, sensing my arms, humming quietly, nothing too bad. When I was eight and Dr. Flagner said, it's Tourette's. Dr. Flagner said, if he were me, he wouldn't go around telling everybody because Tourette's is a very misunderstood disorder. And if people knew, they treat me different. Now, my Tourette's is hard to hide, but I have to try if I want to make friends. I have to try. I don't realize I'm doing it, twirling and yanking until mom reaches for the craft scissors. Okay, sweet pea, time to fix this little problem. No, please, cut off my arm, but not my hair. I hold still while she cuts. Hacks, chops my precious hair short. As short as a boy. On the first day at my new school, I tried to sit alone in the cafeteria during lunch. But a group of girls yell my name and then giggle to themselves as soon as I look over. They seem nice telling me their names. Ivy, Hazel, Gwyneth. But then, the interrogation begins. We heard you making a weird noise this morning. It sounded like a frog. Oh, no, please don't ask me about croak, croak. Every time I think about it, I do it. Gwyneth points at me. It was you making that noise. The girls laugh. Sometimes my tics are like gentle whispers, asking me to do things, to say things. And if I try real hard, I can hold them off for a while. But other times, they're like a shout, jumping out so loud and strong, I could never hope to stop them. During language arts, I'm reading my library book. When my butt and legs get all twitchy, I shift, shift, shift. I swing my legs in, out, in, out, in, out. Quanith frowns. Can you sit still? If you ever want a friendship blanket, you might want to act normal. Ivy, Hazel, and me all have friendship blankets. Every girl in the grade has one except for you. The top of my head itches, tickles, tingles. My hand forms into a fist. I itch the spot with my knuckles. The spot tingles again. I strain my neck, my back. No head, I tell it. You do not itch. I do not feel you. 
I resist, but the feeling gains momentum like a bicycle rolling down a hill until it's out of control. Whack, whack, whack. Kids laugh. I feel everybody staring at me. I squeeze my body tight, but it's no use. They just keep coming, pelting me like hail in a storm until I'm dented up. I tap my foot hard so hard I hit my head on the desk behind me. First, I notice the pain. Second, laughter coming from every corner of the room, burning my ears like poison. I have to get away. I have to hide what's inside. I locate the door with tears spilling over like a rushing waterfall. I run. I struggled to be accepted at the school as I attempted to hide my threats from my classmates. Then my mother forced us to move yet again. And I had the chance to make a fresh start. This time I vowed to do things differently. I'm Calliope Snow, but you can call me Callie. I like comfy clothes and someday I'll be the first woman to walk on the moon. My throat makes a funny sound and my arms jerk upward. Tell them, tell them Calliope, do it. I have a neurological disorder called Tourette's syndrome. Maybe you've heard of it. Sometimes I make faces or noises that I don't mean to make. So if you happen to hear me croak like a frog, just ignore me, okay? I laugh. And 29 students laugh with me. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So, all right, Jane Callanan is going to be up next. You're not on camera yet, Jane. Um, and Jane is performing in non-original oratory. So again, that is a speech that someone else gave at some point. And now she is going to be giving it for us today as her own. Jane, you are now on camera. Go for it. Okay. As a result of war throughout the world, men and women have had to flee their homes, searching for safety in other countries. Recently, Syrian refugees, innocent victims caught in a world of violence have been among these people. In 2014, at a tech convention, Melissa Fleming told the story of two Syrian refugees who risked their lives to survive. In her speech, a boat of 500 refugees sunk at sea. Every day, I listen to harrowing stories of people fleeing for their lives across dangerous borders and unfriendly seas. But there's one story that keeps me awake at night, and it's about Doha. A Syrian refugee, 19 years old, she was living a grinding existence in Egypt, working day wages. And the community that once welcomed her there had become weary of her. And one day, men on motorcycles tried to kidnap her. Once an aspiring student thinking only of her future, she was now scared all the time. But she was also full of hope because she was in love with a fellow Syrian refugee named Basim. Basim was also struggling in Egypt. And he said to Doa, let's go to Europe, seek asylum, safety. I will work, you can study the promise of a new life. And he asked her father for her hand in marriage. It was a Saturday morning when the call came and they were taken by bus to a beach. Hundreds of them rammed onto a boat, 300 below, 500 above. Doa was sitting with her legs crammed up to her chest. The scene holding her hand. By day four on the boat, Passengers were weak and weary. Soon, they saw a boat approach. A smaller boat, 10 men on board, who started shouting at them, hurling insults, throwing sticks. The boat started deliberately ramming a hole into the side of Doe's boat, just below where she and the scene were sitting. The 
both capsized and sank. Dola was holding onto the side of the boat as it sank and watched in horror as a small child was cut to pieces by the propeller. The seam found a life ring and Dola climbed onto the ring. Remember, she can't swim. Around them, there were only corpses. Around a hundred people survived initially when a day went by and no one came to help, some people gave up hope. And Doa and Basim watched as men in the distance took their life vests off and sank into the water. And let me take a pause in the story right here and ask the question. Why do refugees like Doa take these kinds of risks? Millions of refugees are living in exile in limbo. They're living in countries fleeing from a war that has been raging for four years. Even if they wanted to return, they can't. Their homes, their businesses, and their towns and their cities have been completely destroyed. Back to Doha and the scene in the water. The scene was getting very weak and he released himself into the water and Doa watched as the love of her life drowned before her eyes. Later that day, a mother came up to Doa with her small 18th month daughter, Masa. Her mother knew she had to do everything in her power to save her daughter. And she said to Doa, please take this child, let her be a part of you. I will not survive. So Doa, the 19-year-old refugee who was terrified of the water, who couldn't swim, found herself in charge of a little baby. Later that day, as the sun was going down, she saw a boat, a merchant vessel. She waved her arms and shouted. Finally, the searchlights found her, and they extended a rope, astonished to see a woman clutching on to a baby. Only 11 people survived that wreck. There was never an international investigation into what happened. There were some media reports about a mass murder at sea, a terrible tragedy, but that was only for one day. And then the news cycle moved on. Meanwhile, in a pediatric hospital on Crete, Little Masa was on the edge of death. The doctors did everything in her power to save her, and the Greek nurses never left her side, holding her, hugging her, saying her words. Amazingly, little Masa survived. And Doa? Well, word went around about her survival too. And the media wrote about this slight woman and couldn't imagine how she could survive under such conditions in that sea and still save another life. But I have to ask, what if she didn't have to take that risk? Why did she have to go through all of that? Why is there no massive resettlement program for Syrian refugees, the victims of the worst war of our times? And why is so little being done to stop the wars, the persecution, and the poverty that is driving so many people to the shores of Europe? Until these issues are resolved, people continue to take to the seas to seek safety and asylum. But no person fleeing war or persecution should have to die crossing a sea to reach safety. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. All right, Nathan is going to be up next. Um, so Nathan is in the category of prose. Um, so he will also have a little binder, as you saw, I think Talia have earlier this evening. And he's not allowed to take any steps, but he's allowed to use hand gestures. 
Um, and so he's got a serious pros piece, and it looks like Nathan is ready for us. Nathan, I'm going to put you on. Nathan, are you? You can give me a thumbs up. They can't see you yet. Are you ready or no? <laughs> He looks like he's adjusting the camera. Nathan, can you give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? How you doing, Nathan? Thumbs up. All right. Can you hear me all right? right? Nathan, you are on. Take it away. Okay. As children, we are taught to dial 911 if an emergency should ever occur. But we don't often think about the person who's answering that 911 call. However, in Caroline Burrow's story, answering 911, Life in the hot seat. The thoughts and doubts of one emergency operator are revealed. Maybe you and I have already spoken, but we didn't exchange names. You may have told me yours, but mine never came up. You might have yelled at me or begged me to hurry or fallen asleep to the sound of my voice. You might have told me something really personal I don't necessarily want to know people's secrets, and I certainly don't want them to know mine. I just like helping people. Every day, I sit down at the 911 console center, telling myself that today could be the day. Today could be the day that I could save someone's life. It's not likely, but it's the little amount of hope that I have that keeps me from getting tired or lazy. It's my fifth week on the job, and so far I've transferred three different cars to the wrong ambulance services and taken I don't know how many calls that turned out to be out of our jurisdiction range. I took this job because I thought I'd be able to help people. I mean, death and camps aren't the only events that make the 911 phone ring. Most of them are actually pretty routine, at least routine to me, like my neighbors are shooting fireworks off again, or someone egged my house. On a good day, I can listen with empathy, dispatch the call, and go on with my life. But on a bad day, well, I never know what's going to come out of my mouth. Thank you for calling 911. All operators are busy with people who are generally trying to not live in constant drama, but actually need police assistance. To expedite your emergency, please choose from one of the following options. If you went to your car to your sister's boyfriend's cousin, who just got out of jail, and whose last name you don't know, please press one. If you'd like us to raise your children for you, please press two. For our injuries, fallouts, and general debacles, please press three. Thank you for calling your local police. Have a safe and wonderful day. After each shift, I go home, the ring of the 911 phone still in my ears. Sometimes the phone rings at home for me, but I'd rather die than pick that up. I've lost my ability to chat. I just want to get by. I want to get to that magical place where I know what I'm doing. I want to be a good dispatcher. But right now, I'm willing to settle for just not killing anybody. Sometimes I find that I want something big to happen. Then one day, a man named Joe Wilson called. When I try to get him to confirm his address, he starts talking about his leg, and he's calling on a cell. So the only address I have to go by is the one he's given me. His words run together worse each second. So I ask again. And instead of answering, he talks about how he's bleeding and how he's fallen from something. I get calls like this all the time. No big deal. He's probably old. Maybe just a kid trying to play a prank. He'll be fine. It's only later that I find out Joe Wilson had been in the middle of a moving day. His wife had gone ahead to the new house. He stayed behind at the old one alone. He fell off a ladder and fractured his leg. He bled to death. I stand there and I cry. I was the last voice that Joe Wilson heard. And the weight of that overwhelms me. 
The things you can't undo get lodged into the dark corners of your mind and are never solved. Just recycled into new anxiety. And I don't want this. I would like to pull away. I'd like to never hear the ring of the 911 phone again. At the end of my shift, my supervisor tells me that you listen to my call. He says he has no problem with how I handled it. And that the best thing to do is to just let go. And the phone rings. And I say, 911. The woman out of the line says, This is not an emergency. She says she's supposed to be at Shepherd of the Lake Church, but she's not from around here. And so she gets lost driving. She said she was near a big gray building. That says Frodis on it. So I say, We're on County Road B, ma'am. Take County Road B, pass Farview, and you'll see it on your right-hand side. Thank you. Thank you so much. And God bless you. I hang up the phone, feeling a lot more accomplished than I probably should. I got my first thank you. I vow to hang on a little while longer. But I make myself one promise. Maybe I'll stop trying to figure out if what I'm doing is right or wrong. Because the one thing I know to do, it's the one thing I never thought I would be good at. Because I am a 911 dispatcher, and I like helping people. Thank you. All right, thank you, Nathan. So before our last performer comes on, um, our last performer is Harry. Harry is in serious um, solo acting. Um, and I think he's going to set up his camera. So we'll give him a second there to set up his camera. Um, and he is performing a piece called The Triangle Factory Fire Project. Harry, just give us a thumbs up when you know you're ready. But you can take your time. No worries. And obviously, we've seen some tech glitches tonight. Um, but this is honestly what all of these eighth graders and the rest of the team have had to deal with every single weekend is thinking on their toes and being flexible when exactly what they want to happen isn't working. And even our judges at home have had to deal with that as well. So not only working on these public speaking skills, but getting creative with technological problems. All right, Harry, are you ready for us? Can you give me a thumbs up? I see a thumbs up. All right, Harry, take it away. William Shepard was a young journalist in New York City in 1911. Witnessing and reporting suffering was his job. However, one day he witnessed a fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, an event so tragic that it would change labor laws forever. 146 workers, mostly women, were killed in the fire, but their deaths were entirely preventable. They died due to poor safety protocols, due to locked doors, and due to horrendous sweatshop working conditions. Shepard's account of this event has been shared through my adaptation of Christopher Wheeler's play, The Triangle Factory Fire Project. I was walking through Washington Square when a puff of smoke issuing from the factory building caught my eye. As I ran towards the building, a policeman galloped by on his horse. There were flames coming from the top floor. The height was 80 feet. I looked up and saw that there were scores of girls at the windows. The flames from the floor below were beating in their faces. I looked up to the ninth floor. Four screaming heads of girls were waving their arms. Call a fireman! They screamed, scores of them. Get a ladder! cried others. Here they come! we yelled. One girl climbed onto the window sash. Those behind her tried to hold her back. Don't jump! Stay there! Then she dropped into space. I learned a new sound, 
the sound of a speeding living body on a stone sidewalk. Thud. Death. Thud. Death. Thud. Death. Thud. Death. Two windows away, two girls were fighting each other and crowding for air. They fell almost together, but I heard two distinct thuds. Then the flames burst out through the window and on the floor below them. The firemen began to raise a ladder. Others took out a life net, and while they were running through the sidewalk with it, two more girls shot down. The firemen held it under them, but the bodies broke it. I saw a love affair in the midst of all the horror. A young man helped a girl onto the windowsill. She put her arms around him and kissed him, and then he held her out into space, deliberately away from the window, and dropped her. She was as unresisting as if he were helping her out into a streetcar instead of into eternity. Quick as a flash, he was onto the sill himself. His coat fluttered upward. The air filled his trouser legs. I could see that he wore tan shoes. His hat remained on his head. Son, dead. Son, dead. The firemen began to raise the longest ladder they had. It reached only the sixth floor. I saw the last girl jump at it and miss it. And then the faces in the windows disappeared. I heard screams from around the corner. I heard them. What I had seen before was not so terrible as to what followed. Up in the ninth floor, girls were burning to death before our very eyes. They were chanted in the windows. No one was lucky enough to be able to jump. But one by one, the jams broke and down came the bodies in a shower, burning, smoking bodies with disheveled hair trailing upwards. <sighs> On the sidewalk lay piles of broken bodies. A policeman went about with tags, which he fastened to the wrists of the dead girls, numbering each with a lead pencil. I saw him fasten tag number 54 to the wrist of a girl who wore an engagement ring. The floods of water from the fireman's hose that ran into the gutter were actually stained red with blood. These girls were shirt waist makers. I remember their great strike of last year in which these same girls demanded more sanitary conditions and more safety precautions in the shops. These dead bodies were the answer. When a stranger dies, it's easy to stay impartial. But when it's dozens of our neighbors, it's impossible not to editorialize. its lives. So here's my opinion. If the owners of the Sherwaits factory had been found guilty of negligence, the entire episode would have been forgotten in a week. But the law said there was no murder. So these became 146 deaths by natural causes. In the months following the verdict, the inquiry into who is to blame gave way to a new question. What do we do now? Weep all day, every day? How, in the end, do we bear the crushing burden of survival? There was 
Of course, no satisfactory answer, but we struggle to find one anyways. Thank you. All righty. So that does conclude our eighth grade performances for the night. Thank you for all of those who tuned in. Virtual round of applause to all of our lovely eighth graders and all of the accomplishments that they have made over the past two, three years, however long they've been on this team. I am so incredibly proud of each and every one of them as regardless of whatever awards they come home with in, at any tournament, they have each grown so much in their ability to own their voice, to own a room as soon as you open your mouth, and to be confident in your words. So I'm super, super proud of you. Congratulations, guys, and thank you for tuning in with us. Thanks, Tom, for being our cheerleader all night. Bye.